the Buddha once listed the two qualities that he looked for in a student. One was that the student be observant, and the other that you be truthful. And you see why when you look at the way he defines discernment. There's another sutta where he talks about seven facets of discernment. And it's not just a matter of memorizing the Dharma or being able to explain it. There's a lot more to being a discerning person. Although the first quality the Buddha does mention is that you have a sense of the Dharma. In other words, what the Buddha taught gives you a good fun to draw from. He would have his monks memorize passages of the Dharma in line with their capabilities. And we have some prodigious feats of memory in the Buddhist tradition. And it's good to have that kind of knowledge to draw on, because we have so much other garbage sloshing around in our heads. Weird ideas we picked up from who knows where. The media trying to make us feel that we lack whatever they're trying to sell. And they teach us values that are not really in our own best interest. So it's good to have a fund of knowledge that really does take your own best interest out to heart and shows you what it is. So having a sense of the Dharma is the beginning of discernment. You listen to it, you think about it, but then you have to develop it. And that's where the books don't give you that much help. In other words, they point you to the fact that you've got to learn, you've got to be observant. The next quality the Buddha listed is that you have a sense of the meaning of the Dharma. Now, it's not just the ability to translate it, but you know what it's for. There are teachings that encourage you to let go. There are teachings that encourage you to develop. The teachings that encourage contentment, the teachings that can encourage desire. So you have to figure out when is the right time for that particular teaching. You hear so much emphasis placed on being alert to the present moment, and the Buddha does teach that in some places. But it's not the whole of the teaching. You have to think about the long-term consequences of your actions. You have to think about lessons you've learned from the past. So even though as we meditate, we're trying to stay focused on the breath, we are thinking about why we're doing this, and also what lessons we've learned from the past. If something comes up in the present moment, you don't just sit there with whatever comes. You figure out what should be done with this. Is this a skillful quality that you can simply allow to grow on its own, or is it something that you have to encourage? The same with unskillful qualities. Some of them will go away when you look at them. It's like turning the light of the sun on a little bit of water. It evaporates. In other cases, it's not going to evaporate at all. You can't just look at it and it's not going to go away. It requires that you exert an effort. So you have to learn how to figure out which teaching applies to which situation. You have to figure out what the teachings are for. So you're not just reading the text, you're also reading the situation. You're reading yourself, you're reading the people around you. And that requires that you be observant. That's why the Buddha was looking for that quality. You see that especially in the remaining factors of the list, as having a sense of yourself. In other words, what are your strengths right now? What are your weaknesses? What needs work? What can you depend on within yourself to do that work? You have to remember that no matter how bad the situation, you've got some strengths. You have a good sense of what they are so you can draw on them. There's self-destructive thoughts that come into the mind. Sometimes they take over. You look at yourself, you don't see anything good at all. We have to realize you can't believe them. They may be right to some extent, but it's not the case that you're totally hopeless. 
the fact that you're a human being and, and if you're observant enough, you can look at things, you can draw on your strengths. So have a sense of what your strengths are and where your weaknesses are and so that you can figure out what needs to be done and how you can do it in your own particular case. That helps you to figure out which teaching applies to which situation for you. Then there's a having a sense of the right time. When is the time to ask questions? When is the time to figure out things on your own? When is the time to listen? When is the time to not go off and just work on your own? This is something you have to observe. There's no book that tells you the basic rules. Also having the next quality is having a, a sense of enough. When is enough meditation? When is enough reading? When is enough food? When is enough sleep? These are things you have to observe on your own. Another quality is knowing how to talk to different groups of people. Back in the time of the Buddha, they had very clearly delineated castes. When you talk to Brahmins, you talked in one way. When you talk to noble warriors, you talked in another way. Nowadays, our castes and classes are not quite so clearly delineated, but you should have a sense of the people you're with and what kind of a conversation is appropriate. And then finally, there's having a sense of individuals. In other words, what kind of individuals are worth emulating? Because a lot of these qualities of having a sense of yourself, having a sense of the right time, having a sense of enough, you can learn a lot if you associate with the right people. When they approach a problem, how do they approach it? How do they stick with the practice without getting all tense and tied up in knots about it? These are important lessons that you have to learn from being around people who have some experience on the path. But you have to know who to look for and also who to avoid. This is especially true now that we have the internet invading our homes. It was bad enough with TV. Now the internet's with us all the time. Everywhere you go, people are glued to their screens. But they're not just screens, they're people sending messages through those screens. You have to figure out who do you listen to, who do you not listen to, what do you, what link do you click on, and which ones do you not. Because there are values that are being imparted, and you want to make sure that you don't pick up all the wrong values, and that you learn how to detect the values when they're a little bit behind the scenes. So all this requires that you be very observant and also very truthful about what you observe. Because it is possible to notice things, but if you're not quite honest with yourself about what you're looking for, you miss a lot of things. They'll be there right in front of you. You detect them, but they don't register. You've got to be very clear about what your goals are and be true to your best possible goals. So all these facets of discernment, one is just having a good body of knowledge, and the rest have to do with watching things yourself, noticing things yourself. This is one of the reasons why in the old days in the forest tradition they didn't explain things very much. Even simple things about like how you clean up a place. I've told you many times with the Chan Fuang, as I was becoming his attendant, he never told me where things went or what things should be done. He told me what they shouldn't be sometimes, especially if I'd done it wrong. I'd have to make a guess. What's the right way to do this? What's the right way to do that? I try to notice when he did things, where did he place them? It was all to encourage my powers of observation and also encourage a willingness to make a mistake and learn from it, rather than expect everything to be handed to you. 
because you're sitting here meditating. There's nobody in your ear telling you to do this, to do that. You've got to figure it out on your own. As we go through life, there's, there's no prompter. The problem is that we have these random voices going through our heads, and we take them as prompters, but we have to be very careful about what we listen to. Aging comes, illness comes, death comes. You have to kind of figure out how to handle these things. We have some guidance that comes from the past, from other people's words. But a lot of it has to come from our own powers of observation, what you do with your mind right now. What skills can you learn about how to keep your mind focused, how to keep it observant, where to focus it? So when aging comes, you don't focus on the things that deplete your strength. Illness comes, you don't focus on the things that make the mind upset. And the same with death. There are ways to focus the mind even as the body is dying, since the mind doesn't have to suffer. We're learning some of these skills as we meditate, or we're told some of these skills as we read about how to meditate, but we have to learn the rest of them from observing our own minds as they relate to the breath, as they relate to distraction, as they relate to greed, aversion, delusion. We have to learn these lessons by being observant. Once you've learned something, figure out what's the right time to apply it, because sometimes you can learn a lesson that will be good for some situations and not for others. But we develop our powers of concentration, our powers of mindfulness, our powers of discernment, so we can pick up the lessons that are here for us to learn. There's a lot to observe right here in the present moment. There's a lot to observe as you deal with issues coming in from the past, planning from the future. As the Forrester Johns like to used to say, there's a dharma all around. It's simply a matter of learning to, to read it, even if it's not in books. And as with learning any language, a lot of it depends on your own powers of observation.